This is Duke University. Welcome everybody to the Duke Gen uh, Startup Showcase. My name is Howie Ree. I work at Duke University and at the Fuqua School of Business, so I just flew up from North Carolina today. Uh, if you're a Duke alum, let's uh, raise your hand and hear a shout here. Woo! All right, awesome. Great to have the family here in the house here. So uh, what you see up here are some of our great Duke volunteers here based in New York City. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. These are the Duke Gen co-chairs of New York City, so you should get to know them. Uh, they work here locally, and they're here to, to, to get to know you and to be helpful. So Sarah, if you don't mind introducing yourself and saying uh, what year did you graduate and what school did you go to and what you're doing now. My name is Sarah. I graduated from Trinity in 2013, and I'm now working for Amazon. Fantastic. Devin? Yes. Hi, my name's Devin. Um, graduated in 2011 from Trinity, and then 2012 from Fuqua Business School. Uh, work at Comerica Bank to help finance startup companies. Hi, I'm Molly Himmelstein. I graduated from Trinity in 2012, and I work at a fintech startup called Electronify. I'm Bill Warren. I'm a current law student at Duke, but I graduate this year and I'll be headed to Wilmer Hale in New York. Wonderful. So let's give a round of applause to all of our volunteers and everything that they've been doing. And we do run uh, networking events uh, throughout the year, so uh, that's a good chance to get to know them more. Or if you want, just reach out and, 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 and uh, take them out to coffee here. So uh, I'm going to ask you all to sit down here, and we're going to call Howard Lerman, Duke alum Howard Lerman, up to the stage. So yes, how, let's give him a big round of applause. Howard is the founder and uh, CEO of Yext, which is the beautiful space we're in tonight. Uh, he's giving this to us, and, and it really came through. And, and gave us all the space and staff to support us. So we're really, truly thankful to be here. I've asked Howard to uh, say an introduction here. I don't know how many of you uh, have been to this space before or know of Yex, but I just thought it would be a great opportunity for him to just say hello to you. So with that, Howard. Thank you. And um, let, me, let me tell you, um, <laughs> you're, you're thankful for this. I'm thankful for, for all of you. you know, w without Duke, we, we wouldn't be here today. Right, and so I saw all of you raise your hands. I know you all have an affinity for this place, right? We're all blue devils. Remember that Wojo commercial where they're taking blood out of the guy and it was blue blood? <laughs> Let me tell you, I have that color blue in my blood. And you know, I, st I practically started this company out of my dorm room. <laughs> not at ACOC, where I lived freshman year. <laughs> not, not, in, not down in the quad, where I lived sophomore year, but, but really, you know, at Irwin Square, where I lived junior year, okay? And, and a lot of guys that, that were juniors in college, they had pictures of, you know, bikini girls in their walls. I, I had a whiteboard on my wall, okay? <laughs> and, um, and, so, and so building a company is something that, I, it would not have been possible without Duke. I met my wife, Wendy, where's Wendy? At the hideaway. She was, she was, uh, she was a freshman, I was a junior. And so we're, we're a real, you know, Duke couple. And, and let me tell you something. A lot of people ask me, you know, what does it take to start a company? And the answer is a couple of things. Most importantly, you, you have to have amazing people. And at Duke, I met some of the most, besides my wife, I met some of the most extraordinary people that, that, that exist. And so in the community here, when you're thinking about starting a company and what you can build and, and the cool things you can do, it starts with respect, and it gets to trust, and, and you can do amazing things if you want to build a company. And so my, my advice to all of you that are thinking about building a company, and this is such an amazing, cool kind of experience that we can all judge startups here, and some of the folks who are competing tonight, I'm really excited to see how you do. <laughs> For those of you that have it in your head that maybe someday I'll start a company, just quit your job and do it tomorrow. That's my advice. Just do it. Look, do you want to start a company? <laughs> yes, you're wearing a suit. You, when you start your own company, you could take that tie off. You could take that suit off. You can dress like me. I'm an idiot. I wear the same thing every day. My point is this. The time is now. The community is here. Look to your left. Look to the people to your left. Look to the people to your right. The people, the most important decision you will make 
is who your co-founders are. And, and, and what idea, because the idea you pursue will iterate, it will change over time. Well, we've, we've changed a million different times and, and we built a really big company and we've only achieved a fraction of what we intend to achieve. So my point is, when you pick the right people and when you're talking to a Duke grad, you're probably talking to somebody that is the right person or the right people. You can do great things. And so, while you're thankful for having this space tonight, I'm thankful for all of you and for this community because we would not be here without you. So look around your fellow co-founders for the companies that will change the world are sitting here tonight. Let's roll. All right. Awesome. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Howard. That was fantastic. Uh, and after the event tonight, we are going to be having an after party at Sarah. Where are you? Shout it out. Flatiron Hall. Flatiron Hall. So please join us there. Uh, okay, so before we begin to the actual events, uh, I want to give you all an overview of what Duke Gen is, a little bit about what's going on campus, and then we're going to let the panelists introduce themselves. So uh, Duke Gen started in 2008 to answer this question, how do you connect Dukies interested in startups? And it started with a couple of Duke alums, one in San Francisco, one in DC, who said, I've been an entrepreneur in San Francisco or in DC for you know, 15, 20 years, but I don't know any Duke alums really. And so we wanted to solve that problem and help alums connect with other alums uh, that are in entrepreneurship, but also students collect with alums as well. So we created Duke Gen, the Duke Global Entrepreneurship Network, and it's all about productive connections. And I hope that as Howie, Howard said, that you walk away tonight with at least one productive connection, either right after the event or, or at the after party. So Duke Gen started with a LinkedIn group. We're now the third largest uh, Duke University group on LinkedIn. We're the largest university-based entrepreneurship group on LinkedIn. This number is a little bit out of date. We have over 7,000 members on our LinkedIn group. Uh, and so that was from zero in 2008 to 2015 right now. And what does that mean? That means that people like Duke alum Chandra Levy up in Boston can ask a question like, hey, can people give me some advice on a domain name? And you see there this blue arrow, and I know for the people in the back you might not be able to see it, but there were 24 comments of Duke alums you know, offering help to Chandra. And so uh, we also have a great Facebook group here. We've got 2,000 members on our Facebook group. Please consider joining. There's just lots of uh, interesting posts and discussions going on all the time. So that was our online presence. After our online presence, we said, let's go ahead and start thinking about an offline presence, events. So in 2009, we started with no budget. We said, let's get Duke alumni volunteers in different cities to host events in their city around entrepreneurship. And so since 2009, we've hosted 300 of these events in cities like these. We've had over 15,000 Duke people RSVP and attend our events. And so this week, this event is part of a round of events that's happening all around the country and even a couple of international uh, cities as well. We have over 500 Duke alums RSVP'd and students as well RSVP'd for these events. Most of those events are happening tonight. And so tonight, uh, you know, there are, there are many events going on. So this is a part of a larger effort that we have. And this is our 20th round of doing this type of networking events. So other resources we decided to put together were a list of Duke investors. We have over 200 that we've listed on our website. Uh, we've done all these interviews with Duke alums, including people that have started some brands, including the following. Melissa and Doug was started by Duke alum Melissa Bernstein. Mint.com was started by Aaron Patzer. Zico was started by Mark Rampola, and many, many more. And then in 2010, a Duke alum and an active angel investor in the Bay Area, Jim Scheinman, said, hey, like we should do a pitch event where Duke startups pitch to Duke investors in front of a Duke-friendly audience. So that's what we did. So this is a picture of our first Duke Gen Startup Showcase in May 2010 at Dog Patch Labs in San Francisco. So these are the eight startups that pitched to these four angel investors. From left to right, it's Ryan Spoon, who's now a senior vice president of ESPN, but was formerly running Dog Patch Labs in San Francisco. Josh Felzer, he's a Duke alum, double Dukey, meaning undergrad and Fuqua. He sold one company for 300 million, another for 60 million. He's invested in about 60 uh, consumer internet companies over the last few years here. Aaron Patzer, he sold Mint.com for 170 million. He's in the red shirt. And Jim Scheinman, who I mentioned, uh, suggested this event. Jim's claim to fame is he's been an investor in three $1 billion companies. 
um, and he's an active angel investor in the Bay Area. And this was in front of a Duke-friendly audience. This was about 50 people, 50 Duke alumni there. And it was such a great event, we said, let's do this in New York City as well. So that fall, we came to New York City where Duke startups pitched to some Duke angel investors in front of a Duke-friendly audience at, Duke, at Dogpatch Labs um, near Union Square. And so this is part of that event. And I want to show you uh, one example of a company that uh, pitched us recently. Guess what? Yet another big security breach today. So now I have to cancel my card, wait for a new one, and then update all the places that have it on file. Like I even remember those. All because some hooligan got his hands on this one number. There, I'm done with that number. In fact, I'm done with any credit card that only has one number. It's too vulnerable. Too dumb. This is smarter. This is final. It generates a new, unique card number for every place you use it. It lives in your wallet, your browser, your phone, anywhere you want to buy something. Let's say I want to buy a luxurious sweater, which I do. When I'm ready to buy, DeluxeSweaters.biz gets a unique number. OrganicLightBulbs.org, GiantBoxesOfWine.gov, a fresh new number for each site. Final has a million of them, or maybe a trillion, I'm not totally. Now see, if there's ever a problem with a merchant, Final automatically shuts down that number and replaces it for me. My other relationships stay safe and secure. With Final, you get total control over your accounts. You can create a disposable number for one transaction, or a multi-use number where you set the rules for how and when it's used. You can even... You just got charged an extra $32 from the Yoga Pants of the Month Club. Does that look right? Uh, no, it does not. I maxed out on Yoga Pants months ago. This ends now. Final tracks every transaction and lets me know if anything looks weird. That way I don't have to worry about security breaches and fraud and checking my statements for sketchy charges. I can just relax and be me. Take back control with Final. So Final Card uh, was one of the companies that pitched at this very event in San Francisco a year and a half ago. Right after they got, did that, they got into Techstars. They subsequently went into Y Combinator. They've raised a few million dollars. They were number one on Product Hunt um, when they launched on a particular day. So just to show you one example of, of one company and what it looks like to, to go through here, um, go through this event. And so for many of you that are in the audience, you may wonder, like, what are some ways to get involved? So please join uh, our LinkedIn discussion group and our Facebook group. Come to our website. We have a new Duke Angel Network. So if you are looking to invest as an angel, please join that. Uh, if you're looking to fundraise for your startup, please apply to the Duke Angel Network. You can judge in the Startup Challenge, uh, many other things. And so just a couple of views from campus. So uh, on campus, and it's not listed on the slide here, we've gotten uh, $15 million from David Rubenstein, which has really fueled innovation and entrepreneurship over the last few years. There's been so many things that have gone on. Just to highlight a couple, we have a Startup Connect summer program, which is uh, partly in New York City. We had uh, 300 startups that we contacted. We had 300 Duke students that uh, opted into the program. We have a startup networking fair on campus, so if any of you are looking to recruit for your startup, please think about coming to campus in February. Um, and just showing you a few examples of other companies that have pitched. I mentioned Final Card. Huckster um, went through this, this, uh, this event here. They raised 5.5 million. Uh, Catherine Minshew with The Muse, uh, they raised one million. They've actually gone on to raise $10 million. They pitched first in New York City in 2011 at our Startup Showcase. Coverhound, Basil Anon, he won the Startup Showcase in New York City in 2010. They raised 6.5 million. They've actually just recently raised 30 million. And Tim Heyer with Gettable, he pitched uh, at the San Francisco one and won there. So with that, I'm going to now let our panelists introduce themselves and then we're gonna get on to the main event here and do the showcase. So panelists, uh, Matt, I'm gonna start with you to introduce yourself. Hey everyone, my name's Matt Withheiler. I'm a Trinity 03 grad, and uh, I'm a general partner at Flybridge Capital Partners. We're an early stage venture fund based here in New York as well as in Boston. And um, what else was I supposed to say? Am I good? Favorite, favorite Duke memory. Favorite Duke, favorite Duke memory. Favorite Duke memory. One of my favorite Duke memories was, uh, I don't know, uh, winning the national championship in 2001 when I was there. Uh, that was a pretty damn good memory. Hey, I'm um, Mangesha Tigler. I uh, co-founded Mental Floss Magazine. Uh, it's a website and e-commerce business as well. But um, 
my business partner, Will Pearson, and I founded it at Duke. Um, I graduated in 01, and uh, my favorite, you know, I was there in 01 as well, so the Duke basketball loomed pretty large, but uh, my favorite memory might be that we tried to throw a wine and cheese party for our magazine when we uh, uh, launched it, but um, Duke wouldn't let us have wine, so we had to have grape juice and, uh, and Cheetos on toothpicks. So. <laughs> Uh, Bill Luby, I'm managing partner of a buyout firm in New York called Seaport Capital. I graduated from Fuqua in 1985, and my favorite Duke memory doesn't involve grape juice. It was going to shooters with both my son, <laughs> both of my sons, one of who graduated last year, and one of who is a freshman this year. Did you ride the ball? Ride the ball? I did not ride the ball. Hi, um, I'm Steve Brotman. I'm uh, uh, a uh, venture capitalist here in the city for the last, ouch, 15 years. Um, and uh, I run Alpha Venture Partners, and before that I ran um, Silicon Alley Venture Partners. Um, I also advise the Pritzker Group. And uh, in terms of um, uh, favorite Duke memories, um, I just did go back to my 25th year reunion, which is depressing in that it was the 25th year. Um, but uh, I was backed by J.B. Pritzker, who is class of 87, and um, uh, I showed up at the CEO summit this year for Pritzker Group because I advised them, and I was introduced as the first company that J.B. had invested in. So I guess as I'm thinking about this panel, um, it is, you know, the alumni relationships are, are very deep, when I meet uh, students and, and alumni from Duke who were, uh, who graduated especially after me, they're far smarter than I am. So uh, I, I pay extra attention and um, you know, it's really amazing how I would, what you've done to grow the entrepreneurial community. I think Howie deserves a hand. <laughs> and uh, it's great to be here. Hi, I'm Amin Makani, uh, I'm Trinity 08. I work at the leading digital location management company, uh, Yext. Uh, my, yeah, I've been here seven years, from when we started in a small dance studio to this 100,000 square feet monstrosity. Uh, my favorite Duke moment is watching JJ and Chris Duhon play beer pong at tailgate. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Uh, my name's Caitlin Donnelly. I graduated Trinity 08, um, and I work for Pearson, which is a large publishing um, and education company based here in the city, and I helped found their venture capital groups. We invest in um, education companies and edu ed tech companies um, in the U.S. and abroad. And my favorite Duke memory, or at least my uh, maybe future Duke memory, is I'm pretty excited to go to the Duke game at Madison Square Garden on Friday. So <laughs> hope to see some other people there. And just some errata here. So uh, Lawrence Lenahan uh, was supposed to be here, but he got sick, so he couldn't make it. Matt Wittheiler did confirm as a panelist, but I messed up. I didn't include him in the program. So some of you have an extra piece of paper. And Caitlin Donnelly, who I saw this afternoon, was invited, uh, but she the, it, it, like went to her spam. So she said she wanted to do it tonight, but she's not listed in the program. So anyways, just, in, just clarifying what happened there. OK, now on to the main event. So the showcase tonight, uh, the startups are going to present. Each team has five minutes. Bill in the front here is going to give a one minute sign uh, and then we're gonna cut them off at five minutes. And after that, they're gonna get two questions from the panelists. Any panelists can ask a question as a total, they'll get two questions. Uh, after that, uh, there's gonna be two winners. So you, the audience, are gonna get to vote with your cell phone um, on our cool system here. And the judges are also gonna select a winner as well. So that's it. We're going to begin the competition. Tom Austin, where are you? All right. I'm going to load your slides here. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Austin, and I'm here representing uh, Bungalow Insurance. Uh, the reason we started Bungalow is because buying insurance online uh, pretty much sucks. Um, uh, we think it's pretty well represented by this chart here, where you can see that insurance pretty much only ranks ahead of cable in terms of consumer experience online. 
And if anyone's actually tried to buy insurance online, you can probably sympathize with this. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a pretty road. And the thing is, insurance companies actually know this. So the vast majority realize they're behind and they want to do something about it. Um, and when we met with a bunch of them, what we found out is what they're really trying to do is they're trying to appeal to the next generation of consumers, the millennials that we've all heard about. Um, and when we thought about why they haven't been successful here, what we realized was they're actually not selling the right product. So millennials are a little bit different than the generation that came before them. Two thirds of them are unlikely to own a house, over half don't own a car, and the insurance companies are still pitching auto and homeowners insurance just like they always have been. What we, re what we realized was that consumers today actually need a different product, and what they need is renter's insurance. And so if you're not aware, renter's insurance is a great product. For under $200 a year, you cover yourself for $20,000 of property protection, $100,000 of liability protection. It's what consumers really need today. And the interesting thing is that consumers, young consumers actually know this. So 65% of people under the age of 35 uh, believe it's a good idea to have renter's insurance, but only 37% do. So that's about a $2 billion gap uh, and about a $9 billion market overall. And that's what we're going after here. So the question is, why don't they have renter? So why don't these people have renter's insurance? Well, the fact is, there's just too much friction in the process right now. So if you want to buy renter's insurance today, you have to call up an agent. They're going to present you with one of 100 undifferentiated options. You're not going to know what's going on. You're not going to have any faith in the process. Most people drop off in this process. Um, so what we did at Bungalow was we wanted to make an easy, simple to use uh, renter's insurance purchasing platform. And so this is live right now. This is bungalowinsurance.com. You can buy renter's insurance in the state of Pennsylvania right now. All you do is you go online, you enter your zip code, you hit show me, you get three simple choices, fill out a couple questions, and you're done. Um, and customers have loved it. We've been live in Pennsylvania since May, sort of a beta phase. We, our NPS is 82, higher than all the insurance companies out there. The people love the easy process. They love the good design and knowing, what they're, knowing that they're buying from a reputable company. Um, the thing is, what we've realized is this is a great entry point into the insurance industry, but we have bigger goals. We think that if we can capture a lot of customers through this process, we can give them an outstanding experience and we can sell them other insurance products in the future. We realize it's going to be hard to build a brand, so we actually have a two-stage uh, business model here and with direct-to-consumer being in the future. In the next year and a half, we're actually focused on channel distribution partnerships. And so what does that mean? Well, the one, basically, we're going to put renter's insurance at, on other businesses' websites, giving us a much broader distribution, which will help us generate cash flow to grow the business. So the one we're really excited about is online rent payment. We're in advanced discussions with two of the leading online rent payment companies right now to, so that when you go on and pay your rent online, it'll ask you just to add renter's insurance. And we believe that this is the low friction process. This is how renter's insurance should be sold. This is what's going to help close that gap. Um, our business model is pretty straightforward. We split about half of our commissions with our partners, resulting in about a $15 contribution margin. And this is the opportunity we're really excited about. Over 90% of insurance last year was sold through in-person agents. Those agents collected about $65 billion in commissions. These are the agents on Main Street sitting in the office doing the same thing they've always done, which is not too much for you, and they're collecting $65 billion a year in commissions. We think this is a pretty much untapped market, and we're really excited to go after it. This is our team. Uh, I work on marketing and design. My co-founder also went to Duke 09. He works on uh, operations. And we both just graduated from Wharton. We have a third co-founder from Wharton who does our technology. Uh, we have a great set of advisors who have a lot of experience both in insurance and in consumer startups. Over the past year, we've made great progress. We've gotten partnerships with uh, some large insurance companies, which is extremely hard to do in this market. And we are about to announce another large partnership with another insurance company very soon that we're very excited about. In our beta program, we've sold about $20,000 worth of policies. We've got six distribution partnerships already. We've had some other great success. Uh, we won the Wharton Business Plan Competition. We actually won the Duke Business Plan Competition for alumni. Uh, we did an accelerator called Dream It, and we got funding from a dorm room fund. Um, and so I'll just leave you with this slide, which is sort of why we think we can be successful here. In a bunch of analogous industries, health insurance, fintech, we've seen this model work. Making the process easy for consumers in a legacy industry has resulted in great success for these companies, and we think we can do the same thing. Thank you very much.
Um, great pitch. Quick question. If I look at this slide, if I think about simple Venmo and Oscar, they kind of went vertical. So you're using Chubb and State Farm and other players to underwrite your policies. Um, can you capture as much value as some of the company names on this logo by not owning everything? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think it, it's an initial step into the market. So a, a big problem in insurance is, is data. And the insurance companies hold on to their data really tightly. So what we're doing is we're going to open up distribution, get a lot of companies into our ecosystem, and then we're going to have the data actually to create our own product. We're really excited about some of the things we can do in that world. We don't even think the renter's insurance product is as good as it can be. So we're looking about two, three years down the road. We want to actually create our own product. Yeah, um, I like the pitch as well. I, I'm curious, how, how do you plan to, um, to market to all these millennials and, and get the word out about your company? Yeah, that, that's an awesome question as well. That's why we're starting with these distribution partnerships. So these online rent payment companies that we're looking to partner with have a combined 20 million renters on their platform. Um, and so we think that getting in front of that many consumers will give us the leg to, dri again, drive the cash flow early on and to help us build the brand through more traditional advertising channels. So we recognize that it's going to be really tough to get in front of people. So we think these early partnerships will help us get there. Next up is Cook Nook. Thank you. Hey guys, my name is Neil Shaw, co-founder of Cook Nook. So have you ever come home seven, eight o'clock at night, you want a healthy home cooked meal, but no one has time to make it, right? You have your kid yelling at you in the background, you're just trying to scramble, get some Kraft mac and cheese to him. You have had pizza, Chinese food that week, and you really don't want to get Chipotle for the like fifth time that week, right? So what are you going to do? Well, Cook Nook has the solution. We leverage excess capacity from home cooks. So people like stay-at-home moms, freelancers, others who are making great, authentic, home-cooked meals for their families anyway, we find them, certify them, put their meals on our platform, and we sell and deliver those meals to the people who don't have time to cook. So we are a peer-to-peer -peer food sharing platform. You can think of us kind of like Airbnb or Etsy, but for food. Our model's pretty simple, 20% 20 per, 20 commission right off the top. Um, and we have two options. You can do on-demand meals. So say it's 7 o'clock, you want a healthy meal right then and there, no problem. Or if you're more of a planner, um, you can do a monthly subscription option as well. Right now, all of our meals are about 10 bucks, but we're evolving to a model that's actually dynamic in pricing. So say you have crab cakes or lobster or more premium meals, we'll let cooks name the price in the future. And we outsource all of our delivery through Sidecar and Delive. Uh, we currently are based in Washington, DC, and deliver all over the city and one of the suburbs. And we launched earlier this year. So Cook Nook is the only service in the country right now that delivers on-demand home-cooked food. So there are a few players out there like Sprague or Muntry that are essentially caterers, making food in bulk, lots of salt, preservatives, oil, all the nasty stuff you really don't want in your food, but they use the internet to deliver a single portion to your door. Um, if you want something more social, you can eat in someone's home. That's an option. We've all heard of Blue Apron and Plated. They'll mail you ingredients, and then it could take you over an hour to cook that food. Not great on a Tuesday night. Um, if you're really rich, you can have a private chef come to your door and uh, cook for you. And now we're seeing uh, some of these food sharing uh, startups coming up. And essentially what they're doing is they have home cooked food, but it's not on demand. There are minimum quantities. Um, there aren't food safety issues involved. Um, we get rid of all of that. Again, we're the only one that does on-demand, home-cooked, delivered food. And the way we do that is through our demand algorithm. So we'll tell our cooks in advance exactly how much to make. Uh, I mentioned food safety. So we actually hired the same uh, law firm that Uber did to become legal in DC and came up with this strategy. So we meet or exceed all food safety standards, um, including food handling, kitchen inspections, ingredients list, insurance, of course. 
And at scale, we can do a lot of that virtually through technology. Our market is vast. So in the DC metro area alone, our addressable market is $236 million per year. Um, and our model is to get penetration deep in DC and replicate that model throughout the country. Uh, there's a social good element to what we're doing as well. So the underemployed, unemployed, or even what people call unemployable, if they're still great cooks, heck, they can get extra income through Cook Nook, right? Um, and in the US, there's also a lot of food waste. So our model helps uh, reduce that as well. Um, customers love what we're doing right now. The way we acquire customers is through uh, mommy groups, parenting blogs. Uh, we do a lot of work with schools, with uh, densely populated neighborhoods, so apartment buildings, condo buildings. Um, we have great feedback, renewal rates, um, average monthly growth rate. Things are going really well. Um, and just like Uber, Airbnb, yeah, um, and Lyft, this is a volume play, right? So we need to hit a certain volume in order to break even, but after that, we're incredibly profitable to the point where in the DC market alone, we can earn nearly $150,000 per month. Uh, we've been bootstrapped to this point, so it's me and my co-founder, we just put in 20K, and we are looking to do a pre-seed round early next year, 550K, convertible note, pretty standard terms. And we have a great team. So I don't want to brag, but I did go to Duke University's uh, Fuqua School of Business, so clearly that's taken care of. Um, but we have a great team. We have some advisors, uh, potential team members that will come on board once we get funding. So that's about it. Thanks for having me, and happy to answer any questions. I'm curious how many cooks you think you need per food orders. I mean, is this truly, uh, are you matching one, one woman in her kitchen to one food order, or is, is it something more scalable than that? No, so we've done a lot of tests, and what we've done is, even though we'll have some cooks, they'll say, oh, I do dinner parties all the time, cook for 30, 50 people, quality actually diminishes after about 12. So we limit all of our cooks to cook no more than 12 meals per day. So that's the ratio that we're working with. Thanks. Good Thanks. Uh, are you guys going to do some sort of Uber rating system? I could see, especially with food, if someone has a bad experience once or twice, they might be turned off to it forever. Where in a cab, if I have a bad cab driver, I'll be like, all right, fine, I'll still take Uber. Yeah, absolutely. So we're really into feedback. And what we do is after every meal is served, we ask for that feedback. And if we get bad feedback, we cook, kick cooks off of our platform, um, and we pass on all feedback to our cooks to say, hey, you know, this batch that you made, it was kind of spicy, or it was not enough food, or what have you. So we're really big into feedback, and as soon as we get um, two bad reviews, they're off the platform. So we're really meticulous about that. And of course, before any cook joins our platform, they have to go through an onboarding process, and we test every meal before it goes onto the platform. So I'm not fat yet, but I probably will be pretty soon. <laughs> Okay, next up is Farm Shots. Hi everybody, I'm Rebecca, head of product at Farm Shots. I'm Joy, the head data analyst at Farm Shots. Um, all right, so I just wanna start by talking about the problems in agriculture that Farm Shot addresses. So 50 years ago, the average size of a farm in the US was around 200 acres. This means that back then, farmers could just walk through their fields and identify all the problem locations by hand and just write them down on a piece of paper. Nowadays, what we're seeing is that this number of small farms in the US are being consolidated into bigger farms, which means that a single farmer now has to manage a lot more land, and the old solutions no longer work. So this is where Farm Shots comes in. We're a software solution that helps farmers identify problem areas in their fields by pulling imagery from satellites, drone, and aircraft. So we have three primary products. The first is our web platform, where we're consolidating all of this imagery and alerting farmers as problems come up. 
The second product is our API, which allows other software solutions to integrate our imagery and processing into their existing farm management tools. Finally, we also provide advanced analytics, which is provided on a project by project basis and includes things like livestock counting and yield prediction models. So not only are we providing a lot of value add to these farmers, we're also looking at a really big economic opportunity. So if we look at the US GDP, um, it's around $17 trillion, and agriculture makes up $800 billion of this amount. If FarmShots is able to capture even 10 basis points of this amount, we're looking at an $800 million market share. We can also apply a similar analysis to the global GDP, and we come out with an even bigger number, $4.5 billion. We also offer um, you know, a very rational uh, pricing model. Our web platform charges $1 per acre per year. Um, our API works on a acreage and um, tiers of resolution basis. And finally, our advanced analytics is, as we mentioned before, licensed out on a project by project basis. Thanks, Beck. I'm gonna be talking about the three APIs which Beck mentioned, the first being our web platform, which in this case is being used by the International Farming Corporation, a private uh, firm that deals with farming. Uh, they essentially use our product as a scouting task system. So currently, the way farmers find problems on the field is they will send scouts, essentially people, to find those problems. Problems could include things like overwatering, underwatering, disease, et cetera. With farm shots, we want to be able to, to deliver a report to these scouts before they even get onto the field so they know exactly what problems to look for and where they are. IFC used our product and they saw yield increase up to 10% as well as uh, a reduction in full-time employees. So this saves both on cost and time for the farmer. Our second product is our imagery API. This is targeted towards drone and aircraft companies. They're essentially able to use this API to use our front end, the other web app that I just showed, and we provide a unified imagery platform for them. And we, showed that we saw that people, uh, companies that use our product, they see a 20% increase in the success of sales demos as well as customer retention. And our final product is uh, advanced analytics, which we do on a customer by customer basis. In this case, our customer is a company, Abacus Bio, that's located in New Zealand. They asked us to do livestock detection, specifically sheep detection. So currently, the way the farmer counts sheep is they'll take a scout and he'll count the sheep. But with an image, you can automate that entire process. Um, so they actually gave us an algorithm that had about 70% accuracy. We were able to get it to 99% accuracy, all the sheep there. Um, and we were essentially able to uh, save the farmer a lot of money. And the bigger picture here is right now it's just sheep. But in the future, it could be anything the farmer wants to count. And we're growing fast. We're currently located in 14 states, mostly, uh, mostly in the southeast region of the US, but we are slowly but surely growing north and west. And we think we, we're going to grow both from a technical and business perspective. Um, and in terms of our competitors, we think we can unify both the imagery and analytics perspective of this product. Um, the fact that we're able to compete with our competitors and we're still a startup is, means that we have a lot of potential for growth. And we have a diverse team that has knowledge of software, analytics, and farming. And we really hope to reshape the future of farming. If you would like to know more or just want to get in touch, here's our info. Thank you. How, how big is the addressable market, the whole farm shooting match? The, excuse me, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Addressable market, like if like every farmer bought your product, what, what does that look like? Um, we're not necessarily aiming for every farmer because um, we're aiming for more large corporations. And uh, again, we think in the US uh, it's a, $17 billion market, if we were to even get 10 basis points of that, we think we can get up to yeah, 800 um, million. 17 billion is what's all of agriculture, not this particular part of the industry. Oh, is that what you're saying? Oh, well, we're... 17 trillion. 17 trillion, excuse me, yeah. We're looking at 800. 800 basis points, excuse me, yeah. Or 800 billion. But 800 million was the entire agriculture, right? Yeah. Not just uh, the part of your business. Yeah. Right. 
So do you have an idea of how big the imagery amount is of that? Um, so the number that we calculate is assuming that everyone in agriculture would be able to use our product. Okay, um, my question is, can you just tell me a little bit more about the servicing component of your product and you know, what, you know, what portion of the product is really technology-based for a service component? Yeah, sure. Um, so by service component, do you, uh, could you elaborate on that a little it bit? It requires people to go and interface with the farmer and help them interpret the results uh, or, no, so or, you know. Oh. Yeah, sorry, so one of the slides that we accidentally skipped over um, was, um, was the workflow slide. So it actually doesn't uh, require any sort of interfacing because what the farmers do is they sign up for our platform, then they use the platform to identify the boundaries of their field, like on a map that's you know shown on the web. Um, and then once that's done, we go ahead and we scrape all the imagery for them and then provide that on our web platform. So it's a very simple process. All right, so thank you very much. Let's give them a hand. Okay, next up is PhotoSwipe. Hi everyone, I'm Brad Rubman. I am the CTO of PhotoSwipe and I'm really excited to tell you more about our company today. So I have a friend, he recently went to Disney World and he has two small kids. He went with another family and they took lots of photos throughout the whole trip. And by the end of it, they had each had about 50 photos on their phone, each had a couple videos and they all wanted to share the photos because they wanted to see the photos of their kids. But how do they do that easily? It's actually pretty hard. If you try to text the photos, you try to do five at a time, it could take you a long time. Uh, what if one has an iPhone, one has an Android? How do you transfer the video without compressing it? So it's actually a pretty hard problem. So this is one of the main reasons we developed PhotoSwipe to solve problems like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you what PhotoSwipe is. So as you can see, we're an iPhone and Android app for sharing photos. All you have to do to share photos is select the photos you want to share, swipe them to the other screen, and they're instantly downloaded onto the other phones. We support both photos and videos, and you can send as many photos as you want. You can send a thousand in one swipe. So my friend that went to Disney World, if he had our app, all they have to do is select the 50 photos, swipe them, and in about 15 seconds, their friend could get the photos. We really think we have a great private photo and video sharing solution. Um, in the time it takes you to send about 10 <laughs> photos by text, you could send 200 via photo swipe. So it really gives users the ability to send the photos and not have to worry about uh, making sure that a friend gets them. You can saw how easy it is to use. Uh, the photos are directly saved into your camera roll, so it's easy to preserve the memories that you really care about and not have to worry about where did I store them on the cloud. We work across platform. As you saw in the video, iPhone to Android works great. Um, even with video, the file format is typically different if you try to email a video, but we worry about that, so you just, just have to worry about swiping the photos. Uh, there's no sign up, which is great. No shared albums you have to worry about. And the photos stay private. Even if you're on the same Wi-Fi network, the photos stay within the Wi-Fi network, so you don't have to worry about your photos going somewhere that you're not really sure what's going on. This also makes it very fast. You might be wondering if we use Bluetooth, but we use Wi-Fi, 4G, 3G, some internet connection, but it doesn't necessarily have to be on the same connection. We launched about a year ago, and we've done really well. We have a, a great traction that we're building up. So to, to date, we're doing about five million photos for the month of November is what we're predicted to do. Um, last three months, we've been growing about 20%. So you can see users are really loving the app, um, sharing more and more photos and videos and telling their friends about it. We're also active in lots of different countries. Uh, the way as the app is developed, you don't necessarily even have to know English to use it. So we're very popular in countries like Brazil and Indonesia where they can see our video and then take that home and swipe with their families. We raised $800,000 last year from local angel investors and Initially, our focus was on proximity sharing, like you saw in the video, two people that are right next to each other. But let's say you're not next to somebody and you want to send photos. That's something we support in our latest version. So all you have to do is swipe the photos, 
will generate a link for you and you can download them using photo swipe. So if you have 100 photos you want to send to your mom, you can swipe those, send your mom the link, and she can get all of them instantly. We think this is going to increase our numbers from about 20% growth to a 40% growth. The next step for us is to get to a million photos shared a day. Uh, it kind of shows that we're a legitimate player in the industry, and we think we can get there in the next six months. We also want to look into raising another round of financing, and uh, so that the app is free right now in the App Store and Google Play, but we're looking to make money via many different ways we could look at. Uh, photo printing is a common one, so let's say I selected a full album of photos, swipe that, and I could get them in the mail in three days. And that could be something great for us because we could do this with a large number of photos and, and really facilitate the, the experience for the user. So we have a team of three people. We're based in Raleigh. And the CEO has its previous startup experience. He's done three previous startups with two exits. Uh, myself and Mike, we can handle all the technical work for ourselves. So we can easily push out updates every two weeks to the App Store to really make our experience the best for our customers. So thank you very much. Uh, come talk to me afterwards. We're always looking for advisors. And uh, download the app on the App Store. Thank you. Um, so, one of the, the big values of this of the of the app, also a great presentation. One of the big values is that um, it's faster than Dropbox. So Dropbox is slow and not not as user friendly. So it's faster. Um, but then that monetization idea is moving back slower. It seems like it's the wrong audience to monetize with that methodology. I, I guess that's not a question, but yeah, that's a great point. Um, and honestly, we don't want to focus on monetization yet. We want to focus on our users and keep growing the app. And we think there's still a long ways we can go in terms of user acquisition before we even worry about monetization. But yeah, when the, the time comes to do that, there's lots of options. Um, you look at other apps like premium features, advertising. Sure. We could find something. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> How do you plan to market and distinguish yourself? Uh, one of the things we've used so far is PR. Um, we've gotten some articles and then they're reposted around the world. So that gave us lots of users in countries like Brazil and Indonesia because they're picking up on articles that are printed by U.S. publications. Um, besides that, there's lots of um, app marketing platforms we're looking into. And then ideally we'll get a lot of word of mouth, especially with this sending to somebody who's not next to you. If you send somebody a text to download the app and get 100 photos, then when they download the app, hopefully they'll keep telling their friends and we'll get that viral chain going. Thank you very much, Brad. Let's give him a hand. Next up is One Hive. Thanks, Howie. Uh, I'm Krishnan. This is Vivek. Um, the fact is that um, I love working in teams. You know, a lot of co uh, collaboration, a lot of work. But I've also been in situations where I've had to stay up till 3 AM and get the work done. And I'm not alone. Right? We've all been in this situation. When you work in teams, we all have to rely on each other for help. We need to understand who's doing what. We need to understand why things are not getting finished. And if they're not getting finished, who can pick up the work and get it done? Right? Now, the fundamental issue with working in teams is that there's no consistency. Right? There's no predictability. Uh, disparate systems, geographically distributed, different skills. and. Um, we do mis uh, have mistakes. When we commit mistakes, sometimes they're not that costly. But if you look at the amount of work that we all put in every day on a daily basis, these mistakes can cost us time and money on a regular basis. This is not just a small team issue, my issue, or your issue. When you look at the broad marketplace, you see that the small and medium business is the most underserved market. There are tons of applications out there, but if you look at the pure numbers, 28 million small businesses, 120 million people employed, 6 million started every year, right? 21% miss deadlines every day. 80% of us just concentrate on daily work. That's all we do. Who's going to think strategically? It all costs us $500 billion just for a small and medium business. So the reality is that despite all this, we still want to work in teams. We take simple steps individually, right? We have our own checklist. We come in the morning, we have a few things we write, and then when we finish things, we just mark them off. 
But the reality is that when we work in teams, we don't know if someone else has a similar checklist. We don't know what they're finishing or not finishing. Too many dependencies. So when you have too much dependencies and there's no way to share, there's absolutely no way to know if the work will get done correctly. Right? So uh, what I'll do is I'll quickly give you a, a description of, of the product itself. So what we did was we created OneHive. It's available right now in the App Store. It's got good reviews, and it's also a responsive web application. And uh, what it does is five things. It's, it's simple. It lets you create a checklist. It lets you share checklists. It lets you share uh, tasks and subtasks within a checklist. You have the uh, ability to track who's doing what, see progress, and also have a lightweight approval process where you can review, approve whether it's, it's fine or it's not. And we also have built-in uh, community uh, templates. So you can either create your own or use uh, the community's uh, templates. Uh, so yeah, these are some screenshots of the product itself. Uh, so again, where do we fit? Uh, what, uh, what we did with OneHive was that we took the simplicity of consumer list applications and reduced the complexity of project management applications. And OneHive essentially, as a product, is more of a bridge between traditional project management applications and a consumer list applications. And that's basically where we believe the sweet spot is. As Krishnan alluded to, our focus is on day-to-day -day operations, things that need repetitive work and where you want predictability and consistency. And that's what we are trying to do. So uh, we've been in a public beta for the past five months. We have teams using this across the world. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, these are some of the use cases of adoption of uh, some of the teams that have been using the product. Uh, what we did was to run a customer acquisition experiment, if I may call it. We took $5,000, and what we said was that, you know, we'll take the $5,000 and see the product fit, uh, the market fit, as well as also how people use it. And the use cases we had and the, and the way people used it gave us extreme, extremely good insights on how the product is being used. So we have seen in the past five months about a 25% monthly growth and a 70% referral, which is great. It's, a one, it's nearly a one-to-one -one referral. So if I download the app, I invite my friend, and the team starts getting bigger and bigger. And then we have seen, essentially, with all the analytics, we've put in a one-to-one -one ratio of iOS to Android. So that essentially means that we identified a hole in a portfolio, which was we needed an Android app. And that's essentially what we are working on right now. Uh, purely from a tech stack product point of view, we are there. And the ask is for 500K, which is pre-seed. And what we are trying to do is essentially use 70% of that ask in customer acquisition. We understand the markets. We understand the acquisition costs. And that's what we are trying to do here. And this is the team. Uh, you know, we're a great mix. Uh, Krishnan uh, was a senior director at Sabre. I used to run engineering for internal applications for Zynga Games. And uh, these, we are looking for some advisors for, uh, you know, for uh, customer growth, as well as also business development and technical leads. And uh, feel free, uh, download the app. Thank you. Thank you. How, do, how does this become a billion dollar company? It becomes a billion dollar company uh, well, there, are two, there are two avenues to revenue in this case. One is in the paid feature set, you look at essentially what we would call as specific features where SMBs would pay for. Uh, on the other hand, we're also rapidly expanding the community piece of it. So there is always an ad-based revenue stream that can kick in. So we can effectively become the community for SMB checklists. So those are the two avenues that we're looking at uh, primarily to grow revenue. The, um, the extension to the community is that because people are creating checklists every day, there are, we can anonymize the data and see what they are doing. And based on what they're buying, what they're doing, we can actually have uh, an avenue to go reach out to a commercial model, like an e-commerce model, and uh, open it up for people who want to actually sponsor content, and actually want to you know, create an avenue for people to buy more stuff. So that's the um, second angle from a commercial standpoint. I had a question about... Um I feel like uh, Slack and, and various other things like just Uber or, or uh, various apps and things that people use regularly have a big personality component that makes it very attractive. I, I think when you're using something like checklists or to do, to do things every day, like 
to make it less mundane? Have you thought through any aspects? Because this looks very efficient, but, but um, I'm just curious about the, the marketing and the feel of it. Yeah, so there are two aspects to this. One is around the whole um, gamification piece of it, which is what we want to introduce in the uh, paid features. It's not just about the simple use of checklists, but also make it more appealing for, for people to use. But the second really thing is that when people use this, they actually want to get a sense of accomplishment for things that need to get done. Yeah, Uber is there, and then you've got Slack. Slack is going after big businesses, and the cost of customer acquisition is just huge. They've got streams of people trying to sell something at 50000 or 100000 and losing money like, like crazy. Here we're going after the underserved market, and you know they don't use Slack. Now, Slack may claim 10,000 companies a month or a day, but why are they still hemorrhaging money? Right? So you can actually push this top down, but we're trying to go bottoms up. We, uh, and the experiment we did was on Facebook. We did some SEO. And just a five-month experiment, we signed up 1,000 people just to use it. So we want more people to start using it. And if you use it in SMBs, you actually invite your parents. You invite your uh, friends. Okay. Did that answer? Very good. Thank you so much. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> OK, next up is Optoid. All right, um, my name is James Kim. Uh, but, uh, Hi, I'm Ashwat. Okay, let me, uh, <laughs> so let's, let's switch gears and uh, let's talk about tangibles instead, like you know, all these web apps, you know, kind of um, vague, kind of, you know, like out there, but let's, let's get real towards the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, let me, are you driving the judges? Yes, I am. This is the way New York City works. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're we're lucky in Brooklyn. Uh, let me let me just hand these out. You know, just you know, try them out. Uh, actually, sorry, I yeah, we'll be last. But you can pass them around. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, we're uh, Optoid Print Eyewear. Um, get a print, print 3D eyewear. Uh, anyway, the uh, the optometrist has a, this is their problem. Uh, so me, I'm an optometrist. Uh, I got to carry like a hundred thousands of frames just for you to find that one frame that like matches you. Uh, you know, you're going to have like only a couple handful of frames that really like, you know, stand out for you. And uh, it's kind of like dating, you know, like uh, you, you, you have to settle on one, you know, you're, you're always forced to settle. So that's where we come in. We, um, we custom design all the frames. I 3D design and then we 3D print the frames. And then they're hand finished, so we can add color and other different designs. So um, you know, 3D printing is like the new industrial revolution, right? 3D printing is uh, for small scale manufacturing. It it solves the problem of um, you know uh, mass production. You have to make like a hundred or two hundred uh, of one thing just would be uh, <coughs> profitable for the uh, manufacturer. But then with 3D printing, you can just make one, and it's still uh, economical. You want a brown and black frame. There's your first world problem right there. <laughs> All right, so Brooklyn, that's one frame. New York Mets, sorry, uh, they lost. But <laughs> a couple pictures. Uh, I took these photos myself, so, you know. <laughs> Aaron's a critic. Uh, that's our team. Uh, third guy, uh, my friend, Kerry O'Connor, he couldn't be here. Uh, he felt he didn't want to schmooze with uh, Dukies here because he's not Dukies. But he's a Brooklyn artist, true millennial, like uh, person that you guys are pitching to, which I uh, tried to, that kind of market. Uh, that's, that's Williamsburg. That's where we're located. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about revenue. Um, consultation fee, you know, I got to get paid. Uh, 3D designer got to pay too. Got to get paid too. Um, Overhead per product, $50 uh, for the resin, like for, to 3D print the material. Uh, let's see, uh, deadlines and hinges, not much. Uh, hard coding, even less. Uh, and then the profit is quite substantial, 219 per uh, frame. Uh, the market size is pretty large, uh, 19, uh, if you combine the two frames and lenses, it's a $19 billion industry. Uh, so our goal is to try to scale towards uh, the medical doctors uh, and optometrists in the area who, um, especially ophthalmologists, because they don't have, ophthalmologists are uh, people who, uh, they're the medical doctors that treat eye disease. 
that want to, they, they, you know, they, they're not familiar with glasses, but maybe they want to incorporate like glasses into their practice. Um, and it, for us, like all you need is a, a computer and uh, a couple examples of our frames, and uh, we will uh, uh, provide the rest. Um, we have a couple channels. Uh, I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. Uh, Odie's on Facebook, terrible name, but um, the, <laughs> it's, it's actually like the uh, biggest community of optometrists, <laughs> of which I'm not a part of, but, <laughs> but it is one big uh, channel. Uh, Instagram, uh, we have some interesting photos, uh, and of course our actual retail office in Williamsburg. So uh, let's talk about competitors, I guess. Uh, Luxottica, you can't escape Luxottica. Luxottica is the monopoly in the eye care industry. If you have any uh, brand name glasses like Versace, uh, Prada, um, uh, let's see what else, uh, Ray-Ban, uh, yeah, they, they own all that. So you're kind of, you're, you're, you're buying a Luxottica frame if you're buying any of this name brand. Uh, I think Warby Parker, everybody knows Warby Parker at this point, uh, billion dollar valuation. You got the clones of Warby Parker, uh, and then uh, Protos 3D printed eyewear. I don't, I don't know if you guys know Protos, but uh, I guess that's the most similar company out there. Uh, but let's, uh, let's talk about how we differentiate between those. Uh, Luxottica, huge amount of designs. You know, uh, Warby Parker, good design variety as well. Photos, uh, maybe like 20. They have 20 templates. So, but um, pretty much like we open up the entire industry to like an infinite possibility at this point. Uh, Sorry, Jimmy, we're yeah. out of time. Oh, we are? Okay. Uh, let me, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyway, let me just fast forward then. Um, traction going on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right. So we got we got to unfortunately skip our video then. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Let's give him a hand. Okay. Two questions from the panel. Hey, James. What does the optometrist need? To order your glasses? Uh, the optometrist just needs like our templates. And then uh, we're trying, we're, before I, I got cut off, uh, I was trying to explain that what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop a, um, an application to uh, resize and fit these templates so that they have a custom fit for the patients. And all they need is to have like the, the app to kind of give us the parameters, and then we 3D print it and make it and send it to the optometrist to uh, then give to the patient. The patient gives. Uh, feedback about the fit, and at that point, uh, they send it back, and then we uh, finish it with the custom colors. Um, this is a different kind of material than most glasses, right? Yeah. yeah. How, how common is this? Not very. Not very common. So that would be another, another either disruption point or obstacle, is that it is, it is substantially different. Yeah. Got it. Okay, thank you very much. All right, next up is Peachy Labs. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Thank you to the panelists as well. Uh, it's a great community. I'm happy to be a part of it. Uh, my name is Sam Meldrum, uh, Fuqua 2016, so I'm still there, uh, part of the Cross Continent program. I know a couple of you are. I talked to a few. And my partner, uh, Daniel Hawaji. Uh, Daniel is a PhD from Cornell. Uh, I work in the food industry, and uh, we are trying to bring computer vision to the food industry, specifically to diet tracking apps. If anyone here has ever used a diet tracking app, you're probably familiar with the process. It's a little bit of a, um, it's more than a pain. It's, it's, it really sucks. You type everything in. It's impossible to find exactly what you're looking for. When I used it myself a few years ago, I found that it was actually counterproductive. I ended up looking for things that were easy to identify, things like uh, you know, packaged foods, things that had a um, very definitive number of calories so I could track that a little bit easier. So we are working specifically on plated foods, not packaged foods. And we're targeting the 300 million people worldwide who want to track their diet. 
as I said, meal logging is a pain, and we would like to do that through pictures. So rather than typing, you could take one picture and get something that looks like this. We're able to identify what that food product is, how many calories it is, and help you achieve your goals. So the product itself, one photo, uses a back-end technology to identify what that is, computer vision, automatically recognizes all the foods, so in this case, peas, asparagus, chicken, lemon, and will reduce the input time from minutes to seconds. Our revenue model is uh, actually twofold. We've kind of had a bit of a pivot. We originally and uh, are still pursuing an API model uh, whereby we would contact the leading diet tracking apps and uh, basically charge per click. So $5 per thousand images. Revenue would be $5 per user per year, approximately. Uh, and that's based on some personal communications with some of the diet tracking companies. Additionally, we are in the process of launching our own demo app. Um, that is a little less uh, involved. It's going to be a little more, um, I don't know if there's pictures of it or not, but um, it's a little, it's, it's focusing primarily on categories right now. So we've got six categories. Uh, fruits, vegetables, protein, sweets, carbs, and water. Uh, the market size, 300 million users, that's worldwide. That's a $1.5 billion market if you use our uh, revenue estimation, $5 per user per year. Um, there are approximately 30 million who are using the premium functions, the premium features. Um, equates to $150 million. That's just in the diet tracking space. We also believe that there are opportunities within um, diet tracking, uh, or diet tracking um, plus website reviews and restaurant review. The competition is uh, growing. It's a uh, very interesting space right now, a very exciting space. We have tried to group it into four different categories. You've got generic, so that is uh, less focused. A lot of companies don't really know how to monetize right now. They're looking for different avenues and they're throwing a lot of things at the wall. So <coughs> generic, you've got companies that are in a deep learning space, but they're not in food. They're not focused on one vertical. However, they are inexpensive. On the expensive side, you've got a couple companies that are focused on food, but they're using humans. And then we fit in because we're using computer vision, inexpensive, and we're food focused. The big question mark is Google, who has uh, recently demoed uh, something similar. And it's not clear if that is a uh, research project or if that's something that they're actively going to pursue. So right now, our roadmap, as I mentioned earlier, is to identify six different categories. So picture like the one you see here tells you that you've got carbs, veggies, and protein. Ultimately, we'd like to count pixels and use that to make estimations on the percent of foods. Is that five minutes already? Sorry, Sam. That's not possible. <laughs> Quickly, then we get into absolute values. And we've got a great team of advisors. Thank you very much. Um, it seems really cool. Um, it also seems impossible. Um, yeah. So tell me why it's not impossible. Yeah. Daniel. I mean, a, a lot of people have tried this, and you know, if you go back to your, uh, if you go back to your steak picture for a second, you're missing dairy, for instance. There's a glob of butter on top, and if the French fries were on top of the protein, then it would cause another issue. It's just, it's, it works well in the lab, but hard in practice. How are you guys solving that? Well, in the last five years, what you've seen uh, come about with deep learning is that accuracies have just shot up uh, a fair amount. Um, and these algorithms, it's more about like how much data you get to train it. Um, so we're starting off with these simple categories, and we're building our own database, and we're launching this app that will help us uh, provide more data for it to learn. Um, the algorithm has some 
the technology we're building has some shortcuts that that like the generic guys wouldn't have, like or because we're doing food and we have a presence on the cell phone, it will learn from user preferences as well. So it takes other types of data, so like geolocation, previous uh, corrections the user made to the algorithm, or uh, it just noticed that the user repeats a certain meal over and over, so it can kind of use that as a as a as a shortcut to get better accuracy. Oh, sorry. How do you get feedback if you are accurate or not? Uh, if a user is taking a photo and then you respond with some caloric number, uh, then the user eats the food and no one ever knows the caloric number. <laughs> so then the, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll say this, I, I'm, I'm one of the people that do that, I do it every day. I try to get within a handful of calories to the number I'm looking for every day. So I, it, uh, what is what do you think the accuracy is right now? Ten percent, fifteen percent, ninety percent for for the categories. For oh, but not for the not calorically. We have, we're not going. We're not yet at calories. We as we said in the in the, the roadmap, we're going to build this this uh, technology over a series of uh, releases. Got it. So I think there's also a couple ways to address that. It's a legitimate question. It's something that I've struggled with when I wanted to count my own calories. And what I did was always overestimate. So there's a possibility of overestimating what you're eating. Um, and we also think that there's going to be some technological shifts in photography and the way that we can uh, measure depth. So with advances in depth photography, we think it'll give us a little bit better uh, understanding of, of how dense the food is as well. It's not going to be precise, but I don't think any, any uh, nutrition right now, even if you're looking at the Packaged foods is precise. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Next up is Spark. Thank you. Save the best for last. Hi, I'm Maury Hannigan. I'm the founder and CEO of Spark. I'm going to assume that you guys haven't stayed laser focused on the recruiting market, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background here to start. <coughs> There are three things you need to know before you evaluate this opportunity. Um, the first is that LinkedIn has changed how companies recruit. Um, Spark is a recruiting-based um, platform. And before LinkedIn came in and made the database of who works where public, almost all recruiting went through either headhunters or agencies who had proprietary databases. And you're really dependent on them. When LinkedIn hit critical mass, almost every large company brought recruiting in-house. So they're in-house recruiters that are now reaching out to um, high performers at other companies. I hate to say they're not particularly interested in folks who are unemployed and on job boards, but they really aren't. They get paid to go find that high performer and poach them. So that is the recruiting marketplace right now. You've also had a huge shift in the workforce. Um, millennials are now the largest segment of the workforce. This has been true for over a year now. How many of you are age 22 to 35? Quick show of hands. That is your workforce. Um, that's who's being employed now. You use your phone as your primary form of communication. Um, your internet traffic, 64% of it, is video-based. And you communicate via social media. Yes? Yes. <laughs> I have the data that says so. Um, so that's been a big change in who's being recruited. But recruiters' tools haven't changed. If they have a job opening, they're still posting it on a job board that was designed in the 1990s for desktop computers. And the content they're posting is job descriptions. Show of hands, how many people read a job description? All four of you lie. <laughs> um, job descriptions are generally lists of required skills, preferred skills. Um, job descriptions were designed as legal documents, not as marketing documents. And the idea that we use them as marketing documents is just nuts. They're not particularly engaging, they're not helpful, and they're almost never mobile accessible. So this doesn't work. But this does. This is Spark. This is a new way to market your jobs. Every Spark includes up to three videos. The videos are only 20 seconds long. They're of the hiring manager, the person you'd actually work for. Okay, not a corporate video of Anna in the San Diego office you're never going to meet or see, but your actual boss and two people that you'd work with. It also includes the top three reasons to apply, employee benefits, there is a job description because legal's not going away as much as we'd like them to. Um, there's a company synopsis, it's a completely self-contained job profile that is social media enabled and designed for mobile. 
So if you're an employee that somebody would like to hire, they would reach out to you through in-mail, through an email, through a talent community, all the ways that they reach out. They might tweet this to you and say, we have a job that you'd be interested in. Click here to meet your boss. And at least 40% of the time you'll click because you're curious about who's this joker who thinks you're going to be their boss. Um, but that's a tremendous response rate. Um, I was going to show you quickly, this is one of the Sparks that's live on the platform right now, but I think in the interest of time, maybe I'll move on if someone's interested. The videos are short, they're 20 seconds, um, but it gives you, it puts a human face on the job and lets you get a sense of the kind of work environment, the kind of people that are there. Um, it brings it to life for you. And the result is we have an eight-fold increase in candidates responding back to recruiters when they reach out. Generally, if you get an email that says, hey, we have a job that you're interested in, most people treat that like spam. Only 5% ever respond to the recruiters. We've just had a hedge fund that went through and did a very nice clean test. They got a 47% response rate versus their norm. We had one of the big four accounting firms do a very disciplined test. They got a 42.7%. They measured it to the decimal point because they were accountants. Um, we actually haven't had anybody that gets just a 40%. It's always been higher than that, but we're really comfortable saying you can get a 40% response rate from candidates. And that's gotten a lot of attention from big companies. These are all current paying clients on the platform. We just landed our first six-figure deal. Um, two of these folks, we've been launched a year, June, so two of these folks have actually been on the platform a year. Um, both of them renewed their contracts for at least twice as much as their original contract. So, and this is only a, a sampling of the people we have on the platform. Our business model is B2B. We've chosen to price the way the job boards price because our buyer understands that pricing, they understand the ROI, they understand how to compare it, they've got a budget for it. So it's pretty easy to go in and say, you can put your jobs up on Monster, or you can put them into a Spark. And apples to apples, it's a very easy decision to make. Um, the Sparks, we do, there is a, um, a self-serve option. If you're a small company, you can go on. I'm trying to get Howie, who's told me he's got an open position. Um, you can just post one Spark and use it. Um, we do have enterprise pricing for um, packages of 1,000 Sparks, and they're $99 each. Are you about to give me the hook? Uh-oh. <laughs> um, it's a big market. Our first choice is to knock off Monster, which did $700 million last year, as awful as they are. We won the HR Tech Product of the Year Award, the 2015 Mobile Recruiting Award. We've had wildly good reviews in all of the press. Um, there are lots of reasons why we work. We're raising $1.2 million, and that's Spark. Thank you. <laughs> Are you worried about people copying your, the key features of your product? It seems like pretty easy to replicate. Uh, it's actually more difficult than you think. We are, at our heart, a content management system. All these big companies want these videos approved by someone in-house before they ever go public. I mean, anyone could record a video, throw it on YouTube or, or Vimeo, um, but no company will let that happen with employee-generated content. So our secret sauce is in the content management. We have applied for a, patent, a utility patent on that. Um, it's not awarded yet, um, but we're pretty confident that we've, through the use of tokens and so forth, we're able to actually scale for enterprise where we can handle an unlimited number of recruiters with an unlimited number of jobs and videos that all go through an unlimited number of approver dashboards so we can do this to the hundreds of thousands for a large corporation. I got them stunned. <laughs> Uh, how do you distribute the, not the acquiring customers on the business side, I get, but how do you get, do you buy email address lists? Or how do you, how do you get people to discover for, for, Spark? For the corporations who are? No, not corporations, but. For candidates. For can, okay. applicants. Do the, do the corporations send this out right. to their applicants? Exactly. Or? We're not a two-sided market. Okay. Um, we're not dependent on candidates because we have employers telling us, they don't want the plumber in Wisconsin applying to their derivatives trading job. Through either their LinkedIn, they've identified people, their okay. talent communities, they're promoting the jobs because they want to reach out to qualified people, not, I hate to say the great unwashed, but that's kind of how they refer to people who have set up algorithms to apply to every job out there. They want to be more targeted than that. Have you thought about uh, having people respond via video? Yes, right now, when someone applies through Spark, they go directly into the employer's applicant tracking system. 
which they need because they need to consolidate data for reporting purposes, and they can't accept video right now. So the constraint is on their legacy system. Um, we can do that, and we're going to get them there. But right now, we're going to give them something that's just, we're integrated with Taleo, um, all of the ATSs. So we've just made that simple right now. We can add that later. Very good. Well, let's give her a hand. OK, here's how this is going to work. So uh, the panelists, you're going to go with Devin, Molly, and Bill, and sequester yourselves for a few minutes there while you and decide your favorites. You, the audience, now's the time to take out your, uh, your cell phone and get ready to text a number for your favorite team. And we're going to select the audience choice winner now, OK? So oh, Spark won by a nose. <laughs> Congratulations to Spark. Okay, so what's gonna happen next is we're gonna call all the teams up to the stage to um, do Q&A. So if all the teams don't mind coming up, we're gonna do audience Q&A. Anybody in the audience can ask questions. Uh, we also are going to do a little quick open mic, so if anybody in the audience wants to say hello, maybe you've got a startup that you're recruiting for, you're looking for customers, you're looking for a job, uh, anything you want, we'll do a quick open mic. So we'll have the panelists come up and we will take questions from the audience for any of the teams. Yes, Ting Ting. Question from Bungalow. If, if you don't mind repeating the question. Uh, you mean the percent of people who we sent it out to who responded, or the number of people in there? Uh, both. So, yeah, the total number of people you sent it to and how many are responding. Yeah. Um, we sent it probably to, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but probably to about 140. Um, and I would say we got a response rate of about 50%. Uh, standard NPS uh, methodology, so zero through six is a. Uh, oh yeah, 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 sure. So yeah, exactly. So, so actually, the the promoters we refer to Yelp, um, the passives we do nothing, and the detractors. These are the people who give like good versus bad ratings, and the people who give bad ratings are the detractors we reached out to to sort of uh, speak with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next question. Anybody in the audience? Any question? Sarah. Um, this is kind of one hive. How do you guys differentiate yourselves from other systems like Asana that seem like they're also very simple list based? So the big difference is they're project management applications. So you need to pay someone six figures to manage a project. And for day-to-day -day operations, nobody's going to pay six figures to manage a project. And it has a start date and an end date, and there's a budget associated with it. So what we are focused on is day-to-day -day operations. Like, we have janitorial services that use it today. So he says, have you gone and cleaned the restroom in building this, this floor at this time? Right? So that's the key differentiation. Great. Next question. Yes, Mark. Uh, Yeah, so the two ways we've actually overcome that is to actually do tastings. So when we go to an event, when we, say, set up a, an event at an apartment building, <clears throat> we'll be in the lobby and we'll be like, hey, try some free food. And what we've found is that people love it, right? Or even if we can get our cooks to be there it, and so that the customer can talk to the cook, <laughs> there's that personal connection that's being built, and then you feel more comfortable. Because it's, it's like at a restaurant, you have no idea who's cooking your food, right? Um, but if you meet someone and know their story, and we try to describe their story on the website a little bit as well, to be like, hey, this is Sarah, um, she's a school teacher, she loves organic food, et cetera, then you start to build that relationship. So we're all about building that relationship um, to the extent possible. Is that scalable though? Yeah, so the way we're acquiring customers is actually going and doing those types of events, and we'll get huge responses from that, so. Great, yes. I have a Yeah. So, um, it seems like a great app, but what I want to know is 
what's the underlying technology because that will determine uh, what's the latency, how much time it will take, and how secure is the time. Why don't you repeat the question for everyone in the back? So this is a great question about the technology about photo swipe, both on the security side and the speed of the transfer. Um, so in terms of security, we can pair two devices either automatically based on um, a lot of sensors in the phone, like GPS, timing, um, or we could also pair the two devices manually. If you are worried about security, you can enter a five-digit code on the other phone, and the two devices will be paired. Um, in terms of speed, if you're in the same Wi-Fi network, then we can transfer the photo within the Wi-Fi network so it doesn't necessarily leave your house. Um, if you're not next to somebody, then we transfer it um, like any other method. You know, somebody uploads the photo, the other person gets it. I saw a question in the back there. Yes. For Optoid, uh, what, what's the time frame you're looking at for somebody who says, here's a frame, pair of frames I like, and uh, getting the final version? If you don't mind, just repeat the question. OK, uh, he was asking what's the time frame that takes to actually make one pair of glass, pretty much. Uh, you're talking about with the lenses and everything like that, too, right? There's a, a two-step process. Yeah. I, I try to fit, um, and then you send it back and make the final version, which with the color that, or style they like. What's the time frame? OK. Uh, to 3D print the uh, frame, it's well. Actually, let's start with the design. The three, the design takes me about like one or two hours to uh, ready for the 3D print, um, and then the 3D print itself takes anywhere between three and a half hours to uh, six hours for one pair of glasses. Um, you're looking at uh, maybe like a day to um, for the finishing uh, to prep in, uh, and then like another day to put the lens in. You know, all those frames that I had um, uh, in that box, like they took maybe like uh, five days to, uh, from start to finish. But obviously, we're not going to promise them to be ready in five days. Like that's, that's ridiculous. Like, you know, it takes people like one or two weeks to get um, uh, just, just the lenses put into the frame itself. Uh, so, uh, you know, if we tell them it takes like four, three to four weeks to get a custom, fully hand painted, finished pair of glasses with your prescription in it. You know, I think that's reasonable. <laughs> yes. So what's to stop, well, just for a moment, what's to stop flow from progressive creating a simpler website and feeding you guys? Can you just repeat the question for everyone? Uh, yeah, the question was, what's to stop uh, large insurance companies from uh, just com making a comparison website or a simpler website that could compete? Uh, so a lot of the insurance companies actually have a big problem with channel conflict because 90% of uh, products are sold online, I mean sold through agents. Um, so they actually can't deliver an online solution because their agents will revolt. Um, and so it's a pretty big problem for insurance companies right now. They're trying to figure out how to get online without uh, angering their entire sales force. Um, as for most of these companies, they actually generally just don't care about renter's insurance. Um, for Geico and Progressive, it's a, it's a fair uh, worry. But most of them, it's just too small of a product to, to care about. They're focused on the auto insurance market, and so it's pretty much overlooked. We've talked to them, and they just really don't care about it. Next question. In the back, on the right. Yes. Hi. Uh, my question is for Peachy. Peachy. We're develop. Oh, the, sorry. The question was whether or not we are developing our own um, detection, or if we're going to buy it or license it from someone else who's already developed it. We're building our own data set to answer your question. Great. Thanks. Time for one more question, and then we'll move to an open mic. I know David Perkins, you're here. We're going to bring you up to say hello. Anybody here that's got a startup, please come up to say hello. If you're on the job market looking for a job, this is a perfect opportunity to, to say hello as well. So one more question for anybody here. Anybody? No questions. OK. You all can sit down. For, just stay close by, though. We're going to call you up uh, for the feedback portion of it. Um, all right, David, come on up. If you don't mind, I'm going to put you on the spot to introduce yourself and what you're looking for. Anybody else that has a startup or is looking for a job or anything like that, this is the open mic time. I think we're just a couple minutes away from the judges coming back here and saying hello. All right, David, introduce cool. yourself. Thank you. 
Hey everybody, my name is David Perkins. I am Trinity 14, uh, played baseball, gra so graduated last year. This is my third now Duke Startup Showcase. I'm from San Francisco, uh, but just in New York for the week on my East Coast Thanksgiving tour. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of A Vibe, which I started building out of my dorm room at Duke. Um, so it's a social music network that keeps track of everything your friends play on any music service. So essentially we keep track of what you play on Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, you name it. Um, so right now we're in early beta and we're really just looking for beta feedback. Um, it's really easy to get on and sign up for it. Just go to avibe, that's A-V-I-B-E dot I-O. Um, we're looking for some early adopters and potential influencers uh, to drive user growth and um, try to facilitate um, kind of just a, an early uh, an early community of people that really love music that want to share with one another. Um, so that's avibe.io. And um, also, if you want to come up to me afterwards and introduce yourselves, please feel free. Nice meeting you guys. Thanks, David. And yes, let's give him a hand. Took some uh, courage. And David was on the baseball team that swept UNC a couple years ago. So kudos to him. Yes, yeah, so that's right. I think that deserves a round of applause as well. All right, just waiting a couple more minutes here. Who else wants to come up and say hello? This is a great opportunity, as Howard said at the beginning. Now's a great time. Martin, come on up, buddy. Evening, everybody. My name is Martin Nekachuku, Fuqua 2005. Um, Howie, I've known Howie for a long time now. I actually had a tea company called Village Tea Company. We sold it a couple years ago. It was an international key company. It's organic, all natural. And since then, uh, we've been working on marketing strategy consulting and focusing on the food and beverage market. So we've been supporting small businesses and medium businesses that are looking for marketing and brand support, as well as in sort of private equity capital at the same time, looking to invest in some businesses that have long-term um, runway, 10x revenue runway, hopefully over the next you know, five years or so. So if you're interested in something like that, if you have a food and beverage brand that you guys need help with, we, we kind of do all around consulting work as well as um, startup work. So let me know. Thank you, Mark. Hold your hand. OK, they have texted me and said they are coming here. So anybody else for the open mic portion? Yes, come on up. And while you're coming up, Sarah, let's just say again, where, what's the location for the after party? It's Flatiron, Flatiron Hall. Flatiron Hall at? I can buy some drinks, but I can't buy everybody drinks. So get there early if you want a drink. All right. Awesome. Hi, I'm Lauren Demarest. I'm Danielle James. Uh, our company is called Model Citizen. We are a peer-to-peer -peer shopping platform where women can shop each other's closets for rentals and for sales. And we're currently in a private beta, and we're onboarding users and uploading closets. So feel free to check us out on the website and join www.itsmodelcitizen.com. Right now, we're password protected, but we would really love to have you join us. Thank you. And if they want to get through the password protection, what is the password? Or do they just email you? Or <laughs> When you go to itsmodelcitizen.com, there's a place for you to email us, and then we'll send you the secret code. <laughs> there you go. I like it. All right. Very good. Anybody else? I, I see your hand there. All right. Come on up. And I hear them coming, so you're going to be our last one here. I will be super quick. So I did one application for college. I went to Duke undergrad, graduated in 05. I wanted to be a Cameron Crazy. That was really all I wanted out of college. I got it. It was great. I feel like a lot of us have a lot in common here. Uh, my company is called Hungry Fan. I curate game day for sports fans. Uh, food, drinks, tradition, culture, everything that goes into your game day experience as a sports fan, whether you're in your dorm room or you're 55 years old and you're cooking at home. Um, possibly raising some money, looking into it. I have a cookbook coming out next year with Time Inc. Um, I've been offered my own television show as well. Um, but I have products right now that are in Whole Foods in Columbus Circle, and I'm expanding, and I kind of need some help because I'm a one-woman tornado. Um, and if you have any questions or want to talk about it or just want to talk about Duke basketball, I'm here and would love to chat. Thanks. Say the website again. Oh, yes. Hungry fan, like sportsfan.com. 
Thank you very much. Let's give her a hand. All right, I'm going to call up all of the teams to come stand over here. And I'm going to give a mic to the judges here. And so when the judge is, when the panelist is giving feedback to the team, please stand up. We're going to start with Matt. So all the teams, please stand up over here to be there to, to receive the feedback here. All right, so there's no, the order to this is alphabetical. So we're going to give feedback, and then at the end, we'll announce the winner. So um, starting with Bungalow. Um, where's the Bungalow guy? There you are. Um, I think uh, the consensus among the judges was that you did a really good job both delivering the presentation as well as the vision. It was pretty clear that this wasn't your first time giving this talk or giving those slides. So good polish at Dreamit and the other places you've been groomed. Um, and I think people thought that the go-to-market was clever around leveraging the payment networks as well as the product category was an interesting product category. I think the biggest question and challenge in our mind was around the business model of lead generation and the sustainability of that model over time. There's, um, as we thought about it, there's not uh, many great companies that are built off lead gen, um, with the exception of the hotel and flight categories. So how do you not become a lead gen business? How do you own more of the product over time? But good job. And next is Cook Nook. All right, uh, so thanks, uh, great, pre great presentation. We enjoyed it. I think it's an interesting category to be in. Um, ultimately, for us, we, we questioned the scalability given the sort of 12 meals per chef. We also thought that you're losing margin on a bunch of different places, including delivery, um, and you could potentially run into problems with quality control and customers you know, wanting different meals and not being able to find what they want on the platform. So we thought Farm Shots was a really, really good idea. Uh, we thought the presentation, to be honest, could have been a little bit tighter, right? You got a little lost in your slides, um, had a little difficulty with the market sizing issue. And so, uh, you know, just the general sense that the, the presentation could have been a little crisper. Um, it's unclear what the optimal market is, right? It just the, the little knowledge we had over here, the, the feeling was that large farms um, and the big corporate ones had a lot of tools they could already use. Um, maybe it would be better for the smaller farms, but then do they have the same needs, et cetera? So there was a feeling that the end, the end customer was a little bit uncertain. Um, we felt that pr there was just a sense that it might be a little higher touch, you know, that, 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 that the idea that the end user wouldn't need to, uh, wouldn't, there wouldn't need to be a high touch with the end user. And then some confusion on our end as to what the, uh, what the real proprietary advantage was. Our understanding was that you were just scraping the images from, from third party providers and, uh, you know, to the extent that you can do that, why can't others as well, uh, including the people who are providing the images to start with. Um, but, but you know, we, the, the belief is it's, it, it's a big market and a big opportunity, and uh, maybe just a little crisp around, the, around those issues. Uh, next is Photo Swipe, which I am uh, doing as well. So um, uh, with the Photo Swipe product, I think that, um, there you are. I think that the, uh, the, the product itself looked um, really good and seemed to be like a really cool use of technology. Um, and uh, all of us were interested in that and kind of understood the problem statement you were targeting. I think the value proposition was a little unclear, and that was a problem for us in the fact that the space you're in is hyper competitive with tons of different uh, players that are solving similar, although not as easy, um, sorts of needs. And so uh, from a judging standpoint, that was one of the questions that we had is around this value proposition and differentiation in a crowded market. Uh, One Hive is next, um, guys. Uh, we thought we think it's a really great market. Uh, like as you've seen, Slack grow very quickly. Uh, we've seen a lot of other. Uh, it is crowded though, and there's not a lot of switching cost uh, between between products. One thing I'll note just from the SMB market is very fickle. Uh, they don't have a lot of money, so subscri selling subscriptions might be challenging. There are always really strong affiliate plays. Like I, for example, if you had a large list of SMBs, I would feel more than happy to give you money to sell them something on behalf of me. Um, but I wouldn't use that 28 million number as the market size. 78% uh, are non-employers, so they're only one person. Not a lot of need for collaboration. But pretty good. I love the presentation. 
So this is for Optoid. Um, I really thought it was a fun, fun thing. Like the three, using 3D printing is great. Uh, it's so artistic, and like obviously this this huge market with people who wear glasses, and you could easily see how people could, um, you know, use this to design their own glasses potentially in the future. You could see a, a big community of people who are enthusiastic. This. And I like the fact that you said uh, ODU on Facebook <laughs> in your presentation. I thought that was funny. <laughs> but um, but I, I, th I think the biggest, uh, trickiest parts for us were, were one, that um, the big appeal of 3D printing is partially that it's cheap. And, and we have $400 glasses that we're looking at. And the other thing is that it's instant. And, and I feel like the back and forth wasn't as simple as it could be. So um, I, I guess those were the two things that, that we looked for. So PG Labs. So we really liked uh, your presentation. We thought that um, you know it's an interesting problem. Calorie counting is definitely one someone hasn't cracked before. Uh, we but we did continue to come back to the problems with the technology of you know can you really crack this? You haven't gotten to calories yet. Um, is that is that really going to be effective? And then. Um, also, just on you know, the presentation was generally good, but we thought that there were some times where you were you sounded a bit defensive, and like um, you know, mentioning that Google was going into the space doesn't give investors confidence. So it might be something to to just think about how you rework your presentation. Okay, great. So Spark, your last but not least, um, you know, the HR software space is very hot and very topical, and you know, recruiting is the most, most important thing a company does. Um, and you've got great traction, great early success, early wins with customers, um, and you gave a great presentation and uh, refined it from last year, so good work with that. Um, and um, you know, so in terms of critical feedback, I'd say that um, the presentation was geared more towards a um, little, little more to, too much about the uh, customer per se versus selling investors. Um, you know that's a pretty common problem amongst entrepreneurs uh, because they're so focused on every day. What do you do? You wake up and you sell customers. Selling stock is a little different, right? Because we we don't we care about customers, but we want to make money. Um, so uh, it it's also a tools business, which means that you can produce the you produce the tools, which is, which is great. It works, right? It's, it's functional. Um, the issue with tools businesses, though, is that especially if you've got a, a crowded marketplace of solution providers, it's hard to um, uh, stay, you know, uh, not be knocked off by a bigger Taleo or a bigger platform that's already way in. And you know, it's sort of, well, we're going to integrate you in, and then next year, we're going to integrate you out. <laughs> right? So that's the issue with tools businesses generally, is the knockoffs and established players are a bit of a worry. Not the end of the day, and, and not the end of the world, but you know, one, one thing that we might suggest is, and touched on this a little bit, is sort of how do you, like you mentioned LinkedIn, well, it's a network. There's, there are network effects that lock people in, or proprietary content that um, you mentioned some of the, you know, what I would call process lock-in, um, which, is, which is an okay form, but um, to really scale this up, if, if you can create some type of network effect or some, some way to um, really uh, uh, compete against those other established platforms, that would be great, but you've got great early success. It's early days, you don't have resources to do everything. So you got to do something, and someone, you know, making a product that works is step one. So good work. Fantastic. And so the final thing for tonight is the name of the winning team. Amin, since you're with the X, do you want to announce it here? Uh, yeah, the winning team is Bungalow. All right. Congratulations. Okay. So we're going to take a quick picture with the judges up here with Bungalow. Thank you, everybody, for coming to the event. I hope you do continue to talk to each other and meet somebody new tonight. We are going to be at Flatiron Hall on what street? Some street nearby.